Where do you think perfectionism comes from? Generally, uh, it's a coping mechanism. It's where we fundamentally feel that who we are at our core is somehow insufficient, inadequate, or not enough, which everyone can relate to. We're human. Uh, and so we develop these strategies of which perfectionism, people pleasing is one of them. So anyone who struggles with perfectionism is actually at a deeper level struggling with self acceptance, ultimately. So whoever they're trying to put on this masquerade for parents, loved ones, bosses, it's really because at the core, they're concerned for their own existence, which is the primordial imperative of every mammal, right? We want to survive. But if we think we're inadequate, then we don't want to get kicked out of the gang because if you get kicked out of the gang in our primal DMA, you're in the jungle and you're not going to survive through the night. So perfectionism, yeah. you know, is a coping mechanism for a deeper feeling of inadequacy. Uh, well, well said. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey. I'm always looking for guests that are going to blow your mind or teach you something new. Uh, maybe it's someone you've heard of. Maybe it's someone you haven't heard of at all, but is doing great work in the world. And it's going to offer you actionable things that increase whatever you need more of to be the kind of human being you want to be. Uh, and I call that the human upgrade for a good reason. And the idea here is what you want isn't what someone else wants. Uh, but we all want the ability to control our destiny and to choose the state of our biology. Uh, and I think more energy makes all of us feel better. So I found someone for you today uh, that's going to be really an interesting interview because. His title might be the coolest title ever, Mind Architect. I'm talking about Peter Krohn. He's a world-renowned spiritual teacher. He's a coach. And he's worked with you know, athletes and actors and CEOs and billionaires and everyday people trying to do their best. By the way, find an executive coach with a media presence who hasn't worked with professional athletes, CEOs, billionaires. I dare you. You won't find one. So even though it's cool that Peter does that, so do I, so do a lot of other people. Uh, if you've done it at least once. But the deal here is he's supporting broad numbers of people uh, in addition to special people. And the reason that Mind Architect got my eye uh, is that he talks about the limiting beliefs that, that shape your behavior and your relationships. I come across these every day in my own life with my team, even with myself. And I'm reminded... I was speaking with an employee where there was a communications issue. It was a small communications issue uh, around uh, not getting me out of a podcast interview in time to get into a car to go to my next interview. And she really kindly said, well, I was told that I couldn't interrupt you. And I'm oh, okay. Within my businesses, we don't use the words I was told. Because that's like mistakes were made from Richard Nixon. It's like, who told you? Right, so then we can figure out where was the mistake, where was the misunderstanding, or maybe it wasn't even a mistake, but just like chain of accountability. And, and so we had like a, a line of inquiry, non-hostile, just like, oh, it's totally cool. And, and eventually she goes, you know what? I just believe that. No one told me. But she believed that someone had told her because it felt like someone had told her, but she didn't know who told her because it was one of those limiting beliefs that in this case shaped her behavior in a way that didn't matter that much. It just made me five minutes late for whatever. But it was, it was like an open question mark for both of us. So I think we're going to dig in on things like that. Like where, if you're listening to the show, what is something that's a limiting belief that you believe in that you won't know is a limiting belief because it's a limiting belief? So I think we're going to dig deep here. And Peter talks about spiritual freedom and mental peace and physical vitality. Um, there's a great alignment between that and biohacking. That's why it's going to be a lot of fun. Peter, welcome. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. And there's definitely a lot of synergy between the uh, incredible work you've done, the community that you inspire, and hopefully the words that I'll share today. Not just today, because you spoke at the ninth annual biohacking conference. I did. And by popular demand, you are back at the 10th biohacking conference in Dallas at the end of May. Guys, biohackingconference.com. We just announced another major new speaker who you are going to be really excited about. Joe Dispenza will be on the main stage as well. 
Wow. So this is going to be uh, our biggest and best. This is the conference that launched the biohacking movement. Of course, Peter Crohn is going to be there. So let's get into it, Peter. I, I love Joe. We did the documentary Heal together. We, uh, we trade text from time to time. Obviously, we're in very overlapping fields of helping people break beyond the constraints of their subconscious. So I'm excited that he's going to be there too. I love it. Heal together is awesome. And people might be saying it you know, 10 years ago, Dave, I thought biohacking was rigorous science and monitoring your biology. It is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and when you do that, you end up doing breath work and you end up meditating in a cave and you realize that these are technologies for evolving human beings. They're just technologies that don't have blinky lights on them. If you use blinky lights, it supports the use of ancient technologies and ancient techniques, which is yeah. wh- where it all comes together. So I, I, I love that you guys are in Heal together. And, and I, I think this is just a part of gaining control of your biology. Like, I want to be in charge of myself. I am a meat robot. That's not where it is. No. Right? You're not a meat robot. Or are you? I know, what do you think? Are we meat robots? Not at all. No, we're ultimately, depending on which level of identity you want to associate with, most people become misidentified with this physical meat suit. Like, I am a certain age, I'm a certain weight, I'm a certain height. Um, but from my perspective, you're a boundless, timeless being that's founded in pure consciousness. So for a lot of people, that may be a little esoteric, but it is the blank canvas upon which the physical form gets to manifest. So the unmanifest gives rise to the manifest. So who we are, ultimately, this is why I love language um, and some of these subtle arts like Ayurveda that I've studied, because you recognize the power of who we are as a human being that influences the human part. The human I see is the hardware, which of course we have to maintain, right? If you're driving a beautiful We'll pick your choice of car, Lamborghini, Ferrari, Austin Martin, Range Rover, whatever people are into. You have to obviously take care of the equipment, but ultimately it comes down to who's driving it. And that to me is you know, my area of expertise is what's driving the equipment, the choices, the behaviors, the communications, et cetera, et cetera. How many drugs did you have to take to get here? That's the unique part about my story, Dave. None. Yeah, like one of my friends who does a ton of <laughs> ton of ceremonies, you know, she gave me a really beautiful compliment once because I had to help. I didn't have to. I chose to help her with a relationship thing she was struggling with. And she said, you know what? I've done ayahuasca 15, 20 times. I've done toad, uh, psilocybin, all the things. And she said, you're literally like human ayahuasca. I love that. And <laughs> it, it's funny when, when someone's done ayahuasca, you know, 15 or 20 times, like, oh, are you in training with the Shibibo people in the jungle to become a shaman? Like, no, I, I'm just making progress. Like, when are you going to find out it's not working? Mm-hmm. And maybe the the poster child for that might be um, Aubrey Marcus. Or I think it's like 85 times or something. And and if you talk with uh, with Daniel Amen, I'm, I'm on uh, Dr. Amen's board of directors at Amen Clinics. And it's like, look, Dave, people use ayahuasca a lot. Their brains, man, they don't look very good. Mm-hmm. Right, because he can see the metabolic effects of it. So, and, and I just I use ayahuasca in 1999. I've written about it in in the jungle where they didn't want to give it to me because I was white. Uh, and I'm like, that's only for locals. Why would you ever do that? Um, but I've only done it twice in my life. So I, I think it's it's it has risks, and and there are people who rely on it when there's other paths of healing. And it's been profoundly helpful for some of my close friends. So it's like a double edged sword, right? For sure, but you didn't do it. And I, I think, you know, compassion is necessary. I mean, I've done Aubrey's podcast a bunch. I, I, I love who he is and what he does. And people do all sorts of things multiple times, right? So I think we have to let people choose their paths. And They, they certainly do. I just don't want a bunch of young guys choosing that path right. <laughs> without consideration of all of the possibilities. No, and even genetically, you know, we're both friends with Kashif, right? Like who yeah. I adore and I did a workshop with him and understanding your DNA, we all have a sort of, you know, predisposition to perhaps getting great benefit from pick your poison, whether it's plant medicine or even doing some chemical you know, pharma drugs, which I'm, you know, neither you or I are fans of, but depending on your constitution, you're mm-hmm. going to respond differently too, right? So, and I think that's another sort of pathway into understanding what choices we should make for ourselves. I know for me, I have zero inclination towards plant medicine. Would I benefit? Maybe, but I, mine's much more what's called guiana yoga. It's sort of the mm-hmm. yoga of intellect, right? Understanding through what we call buddhi, um, you know, 
to be able to dismantle these these beliefs, these limitations, these constraints, which I assert we were born with. And that, for me, fortunately, seems to work pretty well, where I'm able to see through just pure awareness where people get stuck and help them break free. It, uh, it's a beautiful perspective. And I want listeners to understand uh, 90 to 95 percent of the spiritual breakthroughs I've had in my life did not come from any kind of plant medicine. Even though I go to Burning Man and I'm not afraid of them, I kind of like some of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, and I, I've I've had beautiful experiences, but the number one is neurofeedback, and number two is holotropic breathing for me. Right, I've really seen profound experiences. And you go to a Joe Dispenza event, yeah, and uh, you'll see same thing, very profound. So you can access your spiritual states Mm -hmm. with your mind and and with your body without any pharmaceuticals or uh, plant-based anything. And and, and that as being part of your operating system is just a precious piece of human knowledge. Yeah. Uh, And so I I like it that you kind of stand as a a figure of someone who can be profoundly aware and successful and has done the work. You just did the work in a way that didn't involve uh, throwing up in a bucket. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> which is probably a good thing. I've always been the purist, you know. I've always liked to sort of be, whether it's my British roots or, you know, I was orphaned at a young age, so I kind of had to figure things out by myself very early on. And so, yeah, I just never, never even did drugs, you know. Growing up, going to college and being an athlete, where there was a lot of, you know, booze and the rest of it, just it just never appealed to me. So I'm very grateful that for whatever reasons, I have a a discernment and a mind and an intellect that allows me to kind of tear things down in the most compassionate, loving way and see what's behind the curtain. So how long have you been a perfectionist, Peter? Um, well, I'm recovering now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, it was ironically uh, not a great title. Uh, my friends at college, now we're you know, going back a few decades, uh, would call me Perf, like as a short really? uh, Perf, for Perfect Pete. And um, I realized at the time, it seemed to be like, what a great compliment. But then I soon realized it was an immense amount of pressure. So yeah. I, I fortunately found my humanity many decades ago and realized that we all fuck up and that I enjoy making mistakes and uh, not having to get everything right. You're very open about uh, your childhood and you talk about uh, perfectionism. Where do you think perfectionism comes from? Generally, uh, it's a coping mechanism. Uh, you know, I use a lot of quotes, some of which you may have heard. That's how I'm writing in my first book. But, you know, I'll say things like being right is the poor man's version of self-worth, right? So perfectionism is a sort of a greater adaptation to that. It's where we fundamentally feel that who we are at our core is somehow insufficient, inadequate, or not enough, which everyone can relate to. We're human. Uh, and so we develop these strategies of which perfectionism, people-pleasing is one of them. So anyone who struggles with perfectionism is actually at a deeper level struggling with self-acceptance, ultimately. So whoever they're trying to put on this masquerade for, parents, loved ones, bosses, it's really because at the core, they're concerned for their own existence, which is the primordial imperative of every mammal, right? We want to survive. But if we think we're inadequate, then we don't want to get kicked out of the gang because if you get kicked out of the gang, in our primal DMA, you're in the jungle and you're not going to survive through the night. So perfectionism, yeah. you know, is a coping mechanism for a deeper feeling of inadequacy. Uh, well, well said. Thank you. <laughs> is it different for men and women? It's different, not energetically, just in the way that it actually manifests. So again, if we look at these primal traits, the feminine tends to be focused on appearance, beauty, in in a different way, but it's more about sexuality, how appealing she is to be attractive to the masculine. And the masculine, in a very typical stereotype, is the performer, the strong, the fast, right? So the perfectionism will show up differently. For a woman, it might be the need to, little plastic surgery, the right outfits, it's all hair, makeup, skin. And for the guy, it might be the corner office, enough money. Maybe even nowadays, someone cares about well, what you wear, what car you drive. I guess people are still into that shit. But that's so they, the underlying energetic signature of perfectionism has the same current. It just manifests in different behavioral traits. What kind of car do you drive? Uh, I, have, I have a few. 
my, my <laughs> favorite, shit, tell me more. <laughs> my favorite right now is a GMC 84X pickup. <laughs> nice. It's really fun. But I have my, actually my favorite is it's an old Defender 90. The last year they made them. Oh, those are cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. The Top Gear guy is into those things. Yeah. They're, they're, um, I mean, again, my British roots, I love it. Um, I've had so many people try and buy it off me for extortionate amounts of money, but I, I can't let it go. So they're close. I, I drive a 10 year old Jeep, but I have a hard sided yeah. hyperbaric chamber. So that's the equivalent of a Tesla because I have my priorities for where they are. Yeah. My everyday runaround you'll kind of uh, enjoy is a Vespa. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. It's just so convenient. Like it's so easy. I can park it anywhere. It gets like a million miles to the gallon. And yeah. That's, Depending on the weather. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. I, I love it. I probably wouldn't want to ride that in ice, but no. Uh, so, so there you go. You know, we, we all have our, our things, even, uh, even you around, around cars and, and things like that. Oh, I know. I, listen, there's a fine line, right, between understanding the difference between being attached to something versus being attached to the person who wants something. Right. Mm. I enjoy the finer things in life. You know, I enjoy beauty. I enjoy beautiful homes, beautiful women, beautiful everything, like even my own aesthetics. Like, you know, I like to keep a tidy house. You know, it's the attachment that is the difference. Like, does it have to be that way? So perfectionism is starting to lean into a underlying pressure, which is really self oppression, where things have to be a certain way versus it's a choice. So, yeah. Yeah, um, I, that's when I made my shift from being a perfectionist to recognizing I have a preference for beauty. Mm. That's a that's a beautiful thing to say, a preference for, versus yeah. if I don't have it, I'm stressed. Yeah, exactly. And how would someone learn to go from, I need to have things a certain way or I'm tweaked, to I like them a certain way, but I'm okay if they're not? It's a big step, you know, sort of from head to heart, right? Those 20 inches. So really that's um, something that I teach. I, you know, I do a three-month uh, mastermind and what I, it was one of the modules I talk about these insidious killers, which are based in language. So even the words you use, like I have to, or I need, I must. These are very common parts of English vernacular that people use or even the should. You should do this. You shouldn't do that. And when people really listen to those words, you'll recognize they're actually based in resistance, right? If I have to do something, there's an energy of pressure there. Yeah. So if mm -hmm. first thing to notice is the language you, you use around whatever it is that you think you have to do, to see, to investigate, is it true? Do you have to do that? And when you really look at it, I promise you, it'll always be a no. You don't have to. Even people say, well, I have to you know, go to work. You, you actually don't. I mean, no, there's consequences. No. There's consequences of all choices, you know. Um, you shouldn't do heroin. I'm again. I'm not suggesting you do, but it's. I actually easy. think you should. If you could get <laughs> pharmaceutical low dose heroin once a week, it works better than naltrexone for longevity. I, I just I, don't have a good dealer. If you if you could hook me up, is out there for sure. Um, <laughs> but if that so that's to start to at least help people shift from the world of suppression and self oppression into the world of choice. To realize, and then if you want to go deeper, you want to look at, well, why is it that who you are believes you should or have to do something? Where did that come from? Where did you learn that behavioral trait? Was it the overarching father figure who was like, well, you have to do this, or the mother, you have to do that? You know, so it, it usually traces back to some experiences, however traumatic in our childhood. In my work, I call those the weasel words because there are ways your ego or your body will, uh, will weasel its way out of doing something. Yeah. Oh, I have to go to the grocery store. That, that means you'll die if right. you don't go. That's what have to means. Like, like, like there is no other choice. Yeah. Like, do you know about Instacart? Like maybe they'll deliver for you or maybe they won't or they'll do it wrong, whatever. But yeah, it's just, or you could fast. All those things, we just don't, once you put in that perspective, you stop being curious because you can't. Mm -hmm. and, and so if my kids say that stuff, even now, and they usually don't because they grew up that way, holding me accountable. Yeah. So if you say I have to or can't, it's always a lie every single time. Yeah, um, it's very subtle though. And people get so accustomed to using certain expressions and phrases. We're creatures of habit. And so it takes you know, a discerning mind and a certain amount of discipline for people who want to catch the words that are coming out of their mouth and really pay attention. Uh, because we... You know, as Joe says, our personal 
reality is an extension of our personality, right? So the way that we perceive ourselves is therefore the precursor to the reality that we think is out there. We think there's a world out there, but really it's just we're experiencing our view of life and that's what's dictating our choices, our feelings, and then the actions that we take. Mm -hmm. It's not often that you decide to permanently add something to your daily stack, but when I discovered Time Lies Mitopure, that's what I did. Here's why. Your cells produce energy every second of the day, even when you're asleep. About 90% of the nutrients you eat and the air you breathe ends up in your cells, where your mitochondria transform it into cellular energy. Mitochondria are super important in your quest to live longer and be healthier and more powerful because they perform many other critical functions in your body that you probably don't know about. Here's the thing, your mitochondria are under attack daily. They get damaged and they break down. And that's where MitoPure comes in. It is one of the most studied supplements on the market that has the power to restore damaged mitochondria. When you're young, your body recycles damaged mitochondria and your cells are loaded with energy. But as you age, the recycling process slows down, broken mitochondria build up, and your cellular energy levels go down. MitoPure actually clears out your damaged mitochondria and makes room for healthy new ones. This effect is so powerful that clinical studies show MitoPure increases strength and endurance in skeletal muscle without any change in exercise. I feel that difference and that's why I take it every day. See for yourself. Visit timeline.com slash Dave and get 10% off your order. How do you know when your view of reality is accurate versus when you're telling yourself a big ass story? I mean, that is the ultimate conundrum, right? Because look at what's going on in the world. People will kill each other for a difference of views, right? My God is better than your God as an overarching theme to most of the wars that have happened in the world. So right. I'm, I'm more woke than you, therefore I have to kill you, that kind of a thing? Yes, and there's yeah. a lot of that obviously happening in the world right now. So I think, you know, I like the word accurate that you used versus right. I think at least that's an evolution where most people still hang out in the wrong right realm of language and opinions, which just doesn't go anywhere. Um, I, I like to, as much as I can, look at things like what works. You know, what's not right or wrong, but what works, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's not wrong that your, you know, producer assistant thought that she couldn't disturb you or whatever it was, but it just doesn't work for the fact that you had an appointment or an interview to get to, right? So then you get out of the blame and shame game yeah. and we start to tap into efficiencies and things that are elegant solutions. So that's the way I like to look at it is let's not get into who's wrong or right. Uh, but what is, what is functional based on the intention that we're trying to accomplish it? I was in a conversation with a, a teenager uh, a couple of weeks ago and he was, he was really kind of hung up on, on, you know, being defensive, like just always being right. And any parent yeah. of teenagers knows like this is a thing. They go through that in their you know, mid-teens where they can do no wrong. Yeah. Uh, but I was being curious and we talked about it. And and I'm fortunate that sometimes teenagers will listen to me because I have a lot of followers. I, I don't know exactly where that works. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and it, it, we got into exactly what you're talking about with the idea of being wrong. Yeah. And it turns out for a young mind and a young heart, being wrong means being unlovable for a lot of people right now, which is why you see the defensiveness in kids and in adults. Yeah. Uh, and when you can recharacterize it from right or wrong to accurate or inaccurate, or did it work or did it not work? Or yeah. even just, did you learn? Because it was a mistake. And yeah. a mistake is not wrong. A mistake is learning. Yeah. Uh, and you could like see physical relaxation like, oh, I guess if I make a mistake, I am still lovable. And so many of us, including me as a kid, we get this message that, you know, you have to be perfect. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And that if you don't, you know, they're, they're going to throw you out of the tribe. Yeah. If you were 25 and just hearing this for the first time going, oh my God, I totally have perfectionism. What is the first thing you would do to start tackling perfectionism? Great question. And... To speak first to the teenage conversation, I, I do want to appeal because I help a lot like you kids who nowadays, let's face it, with social media are under immense pressure. And it is ultimately without sounding like a John Lennon song, you know, it comes back to love, um, which really ultimately the biggest challenge there is self-love, right? 
So in terms of coming but out this of- This isn't that kind of podcast. Are we allowed to talk about self-love or will the censorship algorithm stop us? I don't know. That might help people be really powerful and happy. I'm not sure the world wants that. <laughs> not the people in power today. Um, <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> yeah, but in terms of stepping out of that perfectionism, I mean, rephrase your question exactly so I, so I can address it properly. If you were, say, 25, 20, 25 years old yeah. today, and you're hearing this, you say, I'm dealing with perfectionism. Right. What is the very first step you would take to start dealing with it? Great. So the first thing to do, I traffic in language, right? So the first thing to recognize is there's a difference between saying I'm a perfectionist versus I tend towards perfectionism. That's a win right there. Okay, change your language. So recognizing that when you're declaring yourself as something, then so it is, right? It's not a truth to go back. It's not accurate. It reflects your reality. So that's the first thing is somebody might declare themselves, oh, I'm such a perfectionist. They might hear this conversation. Oh my God, this is me. I'm such a perfectionist. So that's the first thing. No, you're not. You're not. Perfectionism is a coping strategy on top of something you've declared at a deeper level about yourself, which is in the realm of inadequacy, right? So you could be more accurate to go back to accurate use of language, be saying something like, I'm not enough. Okay, we can, we'll come back to that. Perfectionism is a behavioral adaptation you are unconsciously choosing to compensate for your feeling of inadequacy. Okay, now we're at a level deeper. Now we can get to the core of why you may be choosing that mechanism. Right? So that's the first thing. No one is a perfectionist. You choose it as an adaptation. Now we can look at, okay, what is the precursor to that behavioral adaptation? I'm not enough. Everyone can relate to that. Okay, where did that start? Oh, well, you know, my brother was the athlete. I was never good at sports. And my dad would always go with him to sports and give him the accolades and he'd get bigger. But whatever your story is, that then gave you the assumption that you are somehow less than your brother, your sibling, or whatever. Then you decided at that moment that who you are is somehow not enough. Is that true? Oh, yeah, no, I totally felt not enough. Okay, you felt not enough, but now let's investigate the validity of that statement. Is it true that who you are is not enough? Now, to begin with, the brain might be, especially after two or three decades, convinced that, yes, that's the truth. Okay, where am I going to find this not enoughness? Is it behind your kidneys? Is it in your lungs? <laughs> like, where does it exist? Mm. This is the process I take people through when I'm coaching. That eventually everyone gets to, well, it's, it's in my head. Yeah, it is. It's sort of between your ears, right? It's in your mind. And what is the form of I'm not enough? Well, what do you mean? Like, what's it made up of? Blood, bones? No, it's, uh, well, it's what I say. Yes, it's words. It's language. So what you're trying to convince me is that, first of all, you're a perfectionist. No, you're not. You've developed perfectionism on top of another set of words, deeper code in your subconscious called I'm not enough. But that's language. When people see that and I say, so if it's just words, just words, blah, 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 right. can it be a truth that that's who you are? When they see that and realize it's not a truth, it's a container, which is why I say language, words are the wardrobe for the soul is what I call mm -hmm. it. So right. that your language is shaping the way that you're presenting yourself. When you see that's not a truth, there's nothing not enough about you other than your story. That's when freedom starts. Perfectionism at that point is well, well gone. So it's about freedom from your story and knowing where your story comes from. Yes. And that's sometimes hard to access because if it's a really traumatic experience, which I've helped a lot of people with, you know, the brain does a good job of trying to suppress that because we don't know how to process it. We can't cope, right? So yeah. similar to the body might tuck a bunch of toxins away in our adipose kit tissue to protect mm -hmm. us. Likewise with emotions, if something was too traumatic when we were young, we'll tuck it away and forget about it, you know? So, but yes, what you said, perfectly accurate. If we can sort of reverse engineer what we're dealing with, relationships, health, money, the usual gamut of human problems, where did that come? What does that mean about me? I'm not loved. I'm not worthy. I'm not enough. I'm not safe. These, my book is the 10 knots, the 10 prisons that I'm working on that everyone has. Then mm -hmm. we can look at the validity of that statement. Is it true as an absolute truth that you're not enough? Well, no, but I feel that. Forget about the feelings. Get into right. the truth. Then what's available is what I ask people. What's available in the absence of that constraint? And the number one response is usually, Ooh, I just, I feel so much lighter. I feel free. Now we're onto something. 
Wow. Uh, you, you are going to feel uh, more free. And I certainly have, have lived that. Yeah. Lived that whole, that whole idea that I've been programmed by my environment. One, one of the first personal development things I ever did uh, a long time ago, uh, had maybe seven pages of, of a survey. And they were like really fine print, just like check boxes. Mm-hmm. And these are like behaviors around your house uh, that you saw around in your family when you were a kid. You know, and it was, did you see it from your dad or from your mom? And they're little things and big things. You know, were they messy? Were they not messy? And the interruptions, all these things. Yeah. And, and there was a column for mom and for dad, right? Yeah. And then there's a column for, do I do this? Right? So there's four columns. So then you go through the, the first two, like, okay, mom and dad did. And you go, did I do it? Like, there, I don't do most of them. And then the, the whole exercise was, oh, that other column? Check the box if you do the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. And and after four pages, I just stopped. I'm like, okay, I get it. Like, <laughs> I'm either doing exactly what my parents did, or I'm doing the exact polar opposite of what my parents did. Yeah. And there's very, very few things that I was doing that were not programmed, and I couldn't see any of it. Yeah. yeah. And and that was really an enlightening thing for me. And today, when uh, we're working with people at 40 years of Zen, this is my five day neurofeedback program. The yeah, a recent attendee just said it's like the best plant medicine ceremony I ever did without the plants. Yeah, uh, because you go into these really altered states just from your own brain and their healing states. Yeah. So, what I find is exactly what what you do is that okay when it was bullying, then okay we know I'm still trying to prove I'm good enough. That's why I have a jet and six companies, and you know I'm not happy. Okay, great. That, that's a common thing with people who go there. Yeah, but. Sometimes it's a little bit deeper. Like, I don't know why. And in my case, it turns out I had, uh, I was born with a cord wrapped around my neck. I had birth trauma. Mm-hmm. And I was lucky enough to find someone who could help me go back and figure out what it was and address it. Yeah. What do you do for people who don't remember how they got programmed the way they're programmed? Yeah, great question. And I feel the good thing about not even remembering an event is it sort of becomes irrelevant because the energy associated with it still drives us right meaning yes. the in your case you know what i could see is and also if i have the invitation to point out something behaviorally that would be associated i didn't know that piece of information until you just gave it to me right i'd never heard that so if we feel into and i'll help you are you open to me guiding you a little bit with that absolutely okay so Think about, because you're a dad, so you've obviously experienced having maybe witnessing birth, at least having a baby. I caught a baby, yep. Yeah, if a baby is entering this new paradigm, which itself is shocking, but and they are, quote unquote, being suffocated to a certain degree, what is that child's experience? Well, if you were to feel it, don't, don't know it, feel it, right? Feel into, okay, if a baby is coming in and they you know, potentially can't breathe properly, what, what would that experience feel like for a being? Uh, it's all somatics. And most of the work I do today on myself is around somatics. Like where in the body, where in your energy field is it? And you know, can you manipulate that? But it's not in the brain, right? It, it's going to be so, somewhere in the, the gut. Um, yeah. You know, it, in fact, I like the the homunculus, the, those, old, uh, those old statues from thousands of years ago. Do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, yes, but I, I, I also want to keep you on track, okay. right? Because this is so, what... So what I, from a baby's perspective, you're going to go to the areas where there's the most nerves, which are represented in those statues. So it's yeah. like feet and hands are really big because there's a lot of nerves. Lips, tongue, yeah. right? And then, well, genitals. Uh, and then you have, of course, throat, heart, gut. And sometimes it's weird hips or knees or whatever yeah. um, where, uh, where stuff gets stored. And so if I'm looking at myself now, but I've, I've learned a lot, right? If I look at myself now and I, I'm having a, a thing like that, I'm going to know and I'm actually going to start with where in the body is it? Yeah. And like, what does it feel like? Like, is it hot? Is it cold? Is it big? Is it spiky? Okay. Um, you know, it, does it have a color? And I even teach my kids to draw it when they're first becoming aware of, of emotions. Like, I don't know, we'll draw that one. Yeah. Uh, if, if you're freaking out. And because curiosity turns off fear anyway. So my practice would be, I don't know what's going on in there, but I just don't believe whatever the feeling is because the feeling is probably BS. It's just my body trying to control me. Got it. Uh, until now, I know as an adult nature. male, 
as an adult male, I would assert that that's a coping strategy that you've developed, right? But beneath that, the baby, the infant that's being born doesn't have that kind of intellect, doesn't even have language yet. It's just feelings. There's nothing else. Exactly. So to come back to my question, what do you think that baby might be feeling as they arrive, as they're being born into this paradigm and this cord is around their neck? What is that experience? Oh, oh I understand your question. I, I just yeah. wasn't getting the question. Sure. So, of course, you could say I wasn't getting the question because my ego is blocking you, but we've, we'll, we'll assume that it was just a lack of understanding. Here. Yes, that's quite all right. So, um, I know what I felt there because I went back and I re-experienced it. And it literally, you don't you don't have context. You don't know you're in the womb. So, so one right. second. So, this is going to help you a lot, right? Because this is mm -hmm. one thing that you do. Yeah. Is that you say you don't have context. And when you're mm -hmm. describing the hands and the feet and the genitals, you kept saying mm -hmm. you have. Now, yep. you and I are in a conversation. We've mm -hmm. never had this, so I'm so grateful for your generosity and your vulnerability. But it's more powerful to say I. You can't control. When we, when we say you, it's a safe space. Oh, I can say I. I'm just looking to teach like you as in all humans, but I'm happy to say I if it helps. Yeah, well, yeah. Okay. that's why I asked if the sure. invitation was there for me to help you because it's yeah. one of the strategies. Yeah. Gotcha. I, I get it. So what I felt at the time um, was that I have no understanding of what's happening yet. Yeah. So it's a confusing thing to be in the womb. Yeah. Because it's all new. Yeah. Uh, and I believe now, like I'm going through a process of forgetting whatever stuff I came in with that starts at the moment of conception and moves forward. Um, so what I do recall is the feeling of um, something being deeply wrong. Yeah. Um, but a sense of lack of safety, like something's trying to harm you. And in my case, I had yeah. Um, the doctor went in. I was uh, posterior, but not breached. So they flipped me over several times. And I remember I'm, I'm like, "Well, how about you go fuck off? I'll just flip back over." Um, by the way, oppositional defiant disorder does have interesting roots. Yeah. Um, although that was only part of them for me. Um, I remember that, and then and then you know, being born wasn't the orgasmic, beautiful experience that. Yeah, uh, is our birthright. Uh, by the way, that's why I caught both of my kids because I was compensating, obviously, and delivered them both. But um, yeah, I, I came in, and then in my case, uh, it was even it was a little bit worse because instead of then the bonding that normally would happen, hospital procedures at the time were oh let's you know let's put them in a warming box. They would literally put you under a bright light all by yourself to make sure you are warm. You yeah. know, very, very healing, right? And I didn't... Keep saying I. Keep saying I. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, well, so they put me, but they would put babies back then. So they yes. put me underneath one. Yeah. Uh, and so what that does, that interfered with my maternal uh, connection, actually yeah. human connection. And I remember actually saying to myself, like, I'm all alone. And then if I'm going to be alone, then I'll be alone. Yeah. And that's where I just kind of severed a lot of my human connection until I healed that, that wound that I got at the hospital. Yeah, yeah. beautiful. <laughs> you might have noticed I've written a book on fertility and recommend home birthing or at least kind birthing at a hospital yeah. because it's so, for, uh, it's so formational for humans. It is. Yeah. And I, I'm fortunate I got to do a lot of work on that. So I can talk about it. And it's not its not one of those things where you're, or at least where we'll say my body, because I'm, I'm doing less teaching, but where, where my body, when I would first talk about stuff, you'd feel like all this weird, like, like physical sensations and, and just like, like a creepiness yeah. and like, ew. It, and this is why um, people quite often are freaked out by, by kids crying. Yeah, yeah. I used to be one of those people like there's a kid on the up and I couldn't stand it. Uh, and now I'm like, like, I'm glad it's not mine, but I have zero triggers in my nervous system over crying babies because right. I did a lot of that work. So yeah. it, it's, it's interesting how much of my life was shaped by stuff that I had no control over and that I didn't remember. Yeah, amazing. Um, yeah. No, it's beautiful. And I really appreciate your generosity because everybody's got their version, right? And oftentimes they happen later. And there would have been things that you've experienced as a kid at two, at five, at eight yeah. that would have also been pivotal, not necessarily traumatic, but they helped to define. So I do want you to consider one thing, one constraint, because you use the word that I assert, feeling into your experience coming into this 
this world that I could still see energetically in the way you present, Mm -hmm. which might lend towards a little bit of anxiety, self-consciousness, is where you don't necessarily, that baby, I'm just feeling into it, wouldn't have felt safe, right? Mm Because you said there's an absence of safety, the term you use, there's something wrong. Yeah. When as, as a mammal, when we associate with our reality as either it's not safe or something's wrong, we tend to be a little too vigilant, right? Which is part of your intelligence. It's part of your brilliance. It's mm. part of your observation. I had the same thing, right? No parents. Yep. I'm by myself. I better fucking pay attention to what's going on in the world. Otherwise, I'm not going to survive. But it has an undercurrent of what I call vigilance, which is based in a fear energy. So that is just something to look at for whatever it's worth. Is that not your fault? Just the product of the experience that your soul incarnated to have was to maybe look around your way of relating to life in the realm of safety or if something's wrong. It's interesting when we talk about hyper vigilance. Yeah. Definitely, it's a trauma response. Yeah. And it can be a biological response. Mm-hmm. And, and it's where. It, it gets to be really confusing. A, a, very, a very common aspect of people who've had brain damage from toxic mold, like I did, mm-hmm. uh, or a brain injury, uh, like a traumatic brain injury. Uh, a doctor, Mark Gordon, and I talked about the correlations between PTSD, which creates hypervigilance, yeah. and trauma, whether it's emotional or even spiritual trauma or physical trauma, yeah. that you get the same response yeah. In in my case, certainly I had birth trauma driving PTSD and hypervigilance. Yeah. And later in life, when I got really seriously poisoned by toxic mold, you get this this cell danger response. Yeah. Um, and it's something when I say I'm talking about you now in the plural, people yeah. who've been exposed to toxic mold, uh, we can all find you walk into a building, it smells musty, and you just lose your mind. Like, yeah. Like blood flow turns off and all these things. Yeah. Um, and it, it's interesting, that's also a trauma response and it can be a direct poisoning response. If it's poisoning, it takes time. If it's yeah. trauma, it's to keep your body safe from the toxins, but it happens very quickly. Yeah. And it's so irritating. Yeah. So the number of us walking around with something like this going on that's all tied up in environmental actual safety with yeah. emotional felt sense of safety, man, that's a, a can of gluten-free spaghetti to unravel. <laughs> It is. And the way that then the brain starts to relate to life is that the world, as a generalization, the world is dangerous. And Mm -hmm. when we're looking through that, as you well know, we slide into sympathetic fight or flight. And it is, you know, like cart before horse, a chicken egg, biology, emotion, whichever, it doesn't really matter. But the fundamental way that we're relating to life is that somehow I'm in potential danger. Whenever the brain perceives a potential threat, could be an argument with the wife because you came home late from the golf course. It could be the potentiality for mold in a building, in your case. Whatever it is, people, when they stand up on a stage, they start to get nervous. They speak very quickly. They're sweating. These are all natural biological responses. It's okay. We're human. But what I like to help mitigate and reconcile are some of them that are just not true anymore, right? So you having a predisposition to being sensitive to mold, yeah, totally biological. I've got lots of friends who deal with that having a slightly different relationship to life that the world is dangerous, which a lot of people could relate to. Right. If they have social anxieties and that's not a truth. I mean, we could point out dangers all over the world, but walking around in that state doesn't behoove anybody, right? You could go your whole right. life for the next 50, 60 years and not encounter real danger. You might have a couple of disagreements and maybe someone who comments, you know, nastily on your social media, but you're going to be okay. Right. So, mm-hmm. To be able to reconcile that, remove that for people is incredibly liberating. And why I'm so passionate about that stuff and why I align with your work so well is if you don't remove those constraints, you can't access real health anyway. It's true. You'll Uh, go in and get help and you'll sabotage it, right? I mean, how many times have you seen people do that over and over and over? Yeah. I've got so many beautiful clients that I've helped, professional athletes, thousands of them that have got more resources than anybody and they've got incredible talent. But if in here they're living in a world of constraint and fear, then they can't access the potential of our physiology because they're too often in fight or flight. They don't digest properly, as, as you, know, you know. So you could have your own chef, you could have your own trainer, but if psychologically and emotionally you're living in a fundamental state of survival, 
then at best, what I tell people is you become the best version of your limited self. Mm, that's a great quote. The best version of your limited self. Thank you. Yeah. One of the, one of the things I've learned over the course of, of growing the biohacking movement and just evolving myself, even after you know, six months of electrodes glued to my brain, and you're fasting in caves and traveling around the world and, and all this all this stuff. I have no idea what the upper limit of my own potential is. Yeah. Because I keep finding new stuff. Yeah. And I'm convinced it's unlimited. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but I might be wrong. Yeah. That's so, the mountain without a top. You know, that's the way I live. Like. Yeah. One of the things that I've been working on for years, actually, is how do you become aware of intuition and then how do you train it to be stronger? Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure I know how to do that. How do you train intuition and how do you make it stronger? How do I? Uh, I think, first of all, like anything, we need feedback, right? We have to discover what does and doesn't work for us. I find that the female is more intuitive because they tend to be a little bit, they're more in touch with their feeling state versus men tend to be more associated with thinking. So depending on who we speak... Are, are you saying that women are not just little men? I, I'm, I'm a little, little confused. Little men, mini-me? <laughs> okay. so, I've said the same thing. Sometimes people get triggered. If you get triggered, get a therapist. Yeah. But on average, a woman is more intuitive than a man in my experience. Yeah. That's, what, that's precisely what I'm saying. And I'm asserting it's because they're more in tune with their feelings, which is an energetic relationship to life. Whereas men tend to be more in touch with their thoughts, which is very linear. So women tend to be more quantum. Quantum, you're, you're, you're more in tune with the unified field. Whereas a man who tends to be stuck between his ears it tends to be separated, right? Very logical, sort of um, right brain, where we just want to make everything super practical. Whereas, so for a man, it's taking those 20 inch journey from your head to your heart to feel more, which, you know, you ask any girlfriend, any wife, any mother, any sister, invariably their number one complaint when it comes to men is, I just, I wish they would show their emotions. I don't know how they feel. And so for a man to become more intuitive, got to get out of your head into your heart, and to feel like that guttural brain for women, you know, women struggle a lot because they live in a world where fundamentally one of the biggest contexts that women struggle with is they don't feel safe around men, and rightly so for the last couple of centuries and beyond. So it's, it's sometimes hard, you know, for all our boyfriends and husbands out there, you really want to have an incredible wife. You've got to make sure that you're her pillar, that you make her feel safe. Then she'll be able to tap into more intuitive stuff. So for the man, get out of your head. And for the woman, hopefully you're with somebody that makes you feel secure. <laughs> it, it feels like it's a no-win situation. And I, I've, you know, I, I've studied a lot of relationship stuff um, because I did a conscious uncoupling uh, a few years ago. Yeah. And, uh, and I'm still you know, on, on good terms uh, with my former wife. Great. Know, and it doesn't have to be bad. Uh, but I, I've studied it and it helps that I'm... I'm dating a, a relationship coach who's studied, you know, all the different relationship stuff for many years. So it's, you know, it, it's educational and uh, and fun and informative. Yeah. And there's a dynamic. Okay. A woman says, I just want my man to show his feelings. And if, if a man shows his feelings, he's like, I'm scared to shitless. Then the woman doesn't feel safe and she loses her intuition and she doesn't even like the guy anymore because yes. he's not a pillar if he's showing his emotions. <laughs> And again, that's some light on that, Peter. No, it's an interesting <laughs> conundrum and it can be dysfunctional. It's the way that the energy is shared, right? We want to evolve sufficiently that we get beyond our own little boy and our own little girl, which is based in mm -hmm. fear and survival. So the man, ideally, yes, 90 plus percent of the time, he's the rock. He's solid. He's committed. He's disciplined. He has his purpose. All the things that make a man a man. The woman then feels safe. What happens is if for those moments you get some bad news, you have a rough day, your parent passes or something that can trigger a little bit of receding into our fear response, let's say it's the man, the woman is sufficient enough of a woman, she's not a little girl, that she can, for that moment, hold space for you to feel your vulnerability. Most, unfortunately, relationships are based the other way around, where 10% of the time the man is the real man and 90% he's a little boy, and 10% of the woman, mm -hmm. she's you know a woman, and then 90% she's a little girl. And that's why most relationships tend to be vicious cycles in a downward dysfunctional spiral. And so ultimately, everybody has to do the work. They have to become the man. They have to become a woman. 
But make space. It's really beautiful to make space for your humanity that you can be vulnerable with the right person. That actually then becomes more attractive. Superman has his Clark. Uh, is it Clark Kent? Yes. Whatever. Yeah. Batman has his whatever his archetype of the human is. We we need our kryptonite because as human beings, it makes us human, and that to me is where the most beautiful connection happens. Mm. It's I think it's an age old conundrum where uh, it's it's about finding the right balance, and it's yeah. also just awareness. Both men and women can grow their awareness of you know, what's yeah. happening there. When you map it back to intuition, guys can have intuition. Uh, we have a different kind of intuition than women on average. Yeah. And there are some guys with female energy who probably have female intuition, but I think some of it has to do with hardware. Mm -hmm. um, that's because ovaries have 100,000 mitochondria per cell. Mm -hmm. And men, you know, all, of all the cells in our body, our brains uh, and our hearts have 15,000 mitochondria per cell. And I think mitochondria are our frontline mitochondrial sensors, our, our environmental sensors. In fact, I can prove it. Yeah. <laughs> so they're the ones with the quantum fingers into reality sensing. Mm -hmm. So there are parts of a woman's anatomy that literally have more antennas yeah. than a guy. Yeah. And if there's a, a connection and it, it's not traumatized, um, I think there's, there's a possibility that more information transmits or at least it transmits more easily. Yeah. Um, sort of like... Uh, if you had one of those old radios where you had to like move the knob around to find a, a station, it's it's got a bigger, stronger antenna, so it can it can hear the sounds more clearly. Guys can do it; it just takes a little bit more work. Yeah. And the and I want you to to share your experience and tell me where the the points of disagreement or where the the holes are in this thinking, because I'm I'm honing and and refining my own understanding of this. Yeah. So when when there's intuition happening, yeah, um, it happens before emotion, mm -hmm. uh, at least in my perception. So you have to have a, a process running where you're watching yourself. And you go, oh, interesting. And, and it'll feel like I had a thought, but it was a really rapid thought. Before you really had all the information, you already knew something. Yeah, That's probably intuition. Yes. But if you were to, to draw like a diagram, fear and negative emotions, they happen very quickly after that. So you might have an intuition that was a you know, signal strength of three and you knew it right away. And then fear, which was a signal strength of nine that happened a quarter second later. Yeah. So if you can catch the first intuition that happened before the fear, it's probably reality. Yeah. But if it was fear and then something, it was probably a thought or an ego response. Yeah. So I, have, I look at timing yeah. um, in order to, to determine whether I'm dealing with intuition or ego or emotion. Yeah. You ever no, felt it, that or sensed that? Like, like poke holes in this? No, 100%. I mean, that's how we survive, right? Is that we learn from our environment. You, as a baby, using your example, cord around your neck. Somebody else born to a twin who was the academic, the athlete, they feel their inadequacy. We learn from the relationships we establish with life, with other people, with matter, with space and time. So for me, what you pointed to beautifully when you mentioned emotion for me, what I'd say prior to emotion, if you're sensitive enough, is feeling. And they might, people might collapse the two, but I actually make a distinction. We're sentient oh. beings, right? In Ayurveda, which is why I love studying Ayurveda, they have such a comprehensive definition of, definition of health, which includes the quality of your senses. You know, in the Western world, what is health? You look it up, it's the absence of disease. That's <laughs> like saying you're wealthy if you're not in debt. Right. Or yeah. that one of my, you know, I always joke because I work with so many athletes. Like if one of my MLB guys has been struggling to get a hit, I'm like, hey, I've got the best coach for you. And he's like, OK, cool. Who is he? I said, he's this guy. He specializes in striking out. He's like, wait, so why would I want to go and see that guy? That's like going to see a doctor who understands pathology. You're, you're not going to learn health there. Right. You might save your life in a, you know, sort of an intervention of an emergency. Great. Anyway. The point being, emotions to me belong to the ego. That's a strategy for survival. The feelings are sentient. So the work to become more intuitive and more vital and more alive as a human being, as far as I'm concerned, is the mitigation, the dissolution of the ego. Because the more ego we, quote, unquote, handle, which usually is through awareness and love and mm -hmm. acceptance and compassion, then we can rest. When we rest and we feel totally secure within our own skin, we have more feelings than we have emotions which means we're more in tune with 
reality. I tell people I have an intimate relationship with reality. I'm very <laughs> present. I'm a responder, not a reactor. Most people react. And you look at the word, I'm reacting. It's something I've done before. And that's all ego based. So the subtle distinction, hopefully people get something from that. Sentience is more feeling. To your point, we feel that. When we're, when we're subtly aware enough, but we can only be aware enough if we're not looking out to our environment for perceived threats, which is a fear response. So you have to be comfortable in your own skin, comfortable in your environment, so you can be sufficiently grounded and centered such that you can respond to your environment appropriately. How's that? I, I love it, especially at the very end, respond to your environment appropriately. Yeah. yeah. In, in my world, what that means is being non-reactive to my environment unless yeah. it's a short-term reaction that's to save my life. So there's actually a tiger jumping at me. I want my body just to get out of the way effortlessly. Yeah. Uh, and if it's not a tiger, I don't want to move at all and just be curious about it. Yeah. Uh, and how will I know if it's a tiger or not? My body has to do that because my brain isn't fast enough. And, and your history, right? Like, because yeah. some people, like, I say, if I had a superpower, it's listening. But listening can only occur if you're present. And a lot of people struggle with presence because they're not sufficiently comfortable in their environment because of past trauma. Trauma is a big word, but they, they, somebody screamed at them, a teacher made fun of them, whatever. They were bullied in the, whatever everyone goes through, which is a lot. Then their ability to be fully here, fully present is compromised. Doesn't make them a bad person, mm -hmm. but that's the thing to look at. Then, as you said, to respond, to be response able, which is why I love the word responsibility. Mm -hmm. I'm responsible for my experience of life. Most brains are still wired to think that I feel the way I feel because of life. Therefore, you are at the effect of life, which is another way of saying you're a victim. Again, it doesn't make you a bad person, but you had a bad day because your boss said something. You're in a pissy mood because your wife did something. Now you're giving your power to everything around you, very human, just inaccurate. What, what if I can't be present because everyone else is boring? <laughs> your your boring is your still it's your it's your own creation, right? Yeah, I was trying not to laugh, and you laughed also, <laughs> and you broke me. <laughs> yeah, because um, the person who you think is boring, and I know you're joking, but to the person you think is boring, to his best buddy at the bar, he's fascinating, you know. So again, we start to see our reality is based entirely on our view of things. That's mm -hmm. really powerful when people when I help people in relationships. They think their relationship is over there with the person. No, that person occurs in your reality, the relationships with you and how you perceive them. If you think they're a great person, your behaviors, your communication is in response to that. If you think they're an asshole, that's your view of somebody. The relationship's in you, not with them. Then equally, you adjust the way that you relate to them. It's fascinating. Mm -hmm. it, it is truly fascinating. And um, what, what I teach when people are going through uh, 40 years of Zen, a lot of times on the second or third day, they'll kind of have an ego attack mm -hmm. uh, as they're gaining more awareness and suddenly like everything is boring. Yeah. Where do you think boredom comes from? It, it's, it's an egoic response of the body to make sure you're not paying attention. Yeah. Because it doesn't want you to pay attention because it thinks not paying attention is safer than paying attention. Yeah. So you, you work through it. Um, and then there's another thing that happens though. Some spiritual paths will teach, hey, you should... Um, you know, you, you should feel love for everyone and, and like they're a little bit mushy, but you will come across narcissists. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll come across sociopaths, especially if you become more successful. You work with celebrities and, and things like that. One of the reasons they're so paranoid and weird is because they've been targeted over and over and over by people who want their money and their fame and their power. Like it, it's a thing. Yep. yep. Um, that's why they hang out with each other too, because they know at least that person doesn't want my fame because they're also famous and then they can kind of be themselves, right? And so yeah. you, you see this more and more as people move into different um, categories of career and, and visibility. So for everyone listening, okay, part of you wants to be loving and trusting. Part of you wants to be aware of the takers and make sure that you remove them from your reality. So mm -hmm. is it aversion to them? Or is it awareness of them and a choice that you're not going to have a drink with them because, frankly, it's not worth your time? How do people navigate that very fine line between the two? That's a great question. I always am going to revert back to what 
who are you in the circumstance, right? Because if you understand your true abundant nature, no one can take anything from you. So it may, again, come back to what you enjoyed about what I said, I'm not a perfectionist, I just have a preference for beauty, right? So no one can take who I am. No one can in any way diminish my value. Self-worth is such a misnomer that people don't understand. Your self-worth never changes throughout the course of your entire life because you are at the core, you're, you're the only being of you. Therefore, your value is inherent, it's innate. What might happen is your narrative about it. Oh, I had a lot of money. I was a millionaire. Then I lost it. Like that, the story on the surface, right? So when you really understand the essence of who we are as a being, nobody can hurt you. Nobody can take anything from you. So then you make a choice. Yeah, maybe you prefer not to spend time and energy, which is precious, with somebody who doesn't see you, respect you, be kind to you. But it's not because of them. It's a, a choice for something versus against something, right? Most people sadly make choices to avoid something. They go to the gym to get in shape because they don't want to be fat. As mm -hmm. long as you're being driven by the negatory statement, you're invariably going to end up where you started. So for me, no one can take anything. I'm open to whatever conversation. Obviously, if it's somebody who's being derogatory or making dismissive remarks, I'm probably going to excuse myself at some point or maybe not go back for Thanksgiving whatever it is, but I don't lose anything. I right. have compassion. So again, it's understanding that, you know, the old adage of hurt people hurt people. So if there's somebody who is in any way being derogatory, anybody being mean, they are the ones suffering. And for that, I just have compassion. You can have compassion for, um, for narcissists and sociopaths and bad people and I was on uh, the the Commune podcast, which is a, a big personal development podcast. Yeah, and one of his questions is, if you could have dinner with anyone from all of history, who would it be? Mm -hmm. I thought about it for a minute, and I said, Hitler. Mm -hmm. And the guy just about fell out of his chair. He goes, what, 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 what? I said, here's what I want to know: what made him into such such a demon? Yeah. Like, what did his dad do to him? Like, I, it, this is one of the most evil people in history so we want to know what caused that so that we don't make another one yeah yeah and it's that curiosity thing but i i, I can tell by just this look of horror on his face yeah you know i'm not saying anything good about that guy no other than we can learn from whatever the heck happened yeah uh, and i'd be willing to have that meal to have that learning and then share it wide and, and loud so you can't have compassion even if you don't want to be around someone Perfect. And it's like Thomas Edison said, you know, he said, I can tell you 10,000 things that don't work, you know, with all the things that he invented, right? So it, we learn, we can be sort of informed by our history. I tell people, we just don't want to be defined by it, right? So I love that you have this curiosity to look at. It's why you become uh, such an icon in the biohacking world. And what you've learned is because you're willing to look at what doesn't work which is a Hitler, like metaphorically, right? And we have to learn from that too. Like I you know, work with so many sports teams and often it's a W and an L. That's all they talk about, W or L, win or loss. And I'm like, no, it's a win or a learn. It's not a win or a loss. And so if you're willing to look at life through the lens of, okay, we're all going to fail. We're all going to have our challenges. But to what degree do we get defined by them or do we learn from them in order to access greater forms of potential and ultimately become a better version of ourselves? Mm. That's, the, That's the goal. Ultimately evolve, become a better version of yourself. And one of my things maybe that I stumbled into uh, over, over time was you can make the mistake yourself or you can find someone who's made really good mistakes mm -hmm. and then ask them how to avoid it. And if you're just willing to learn, you can probably you know, skip ahead 20 spaces on the, the playing board. Yeah. And I, I did this from a health perspective in my mid twenties. You know, I, I learned from people in their eighties how they were reversing their aging before we were supposed to be able to reverse aging, and that taught me over the course of years of running a nonprofit in the longevity space the tenets of longevity that became the tenets of biohacking. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's because I learned from my elders who'd done the things that made them old and then undid it. Yeah. And what I didn't do though was do that in business until later in life and. You look at guys like uh, the Marks, uh, Mark Andreessen uh, or Mark Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. um, 
And Dries and I are almost exactly the same age. Um, he wrote the first web browser. I sold the first thing ever sold over the internet, right? He immediately drives or flies, whatever, to Silicon Valley and hooks up with a guy 20 years older than, than him who ran uh, Sun Microsystems, a big tech company. Mm-hmm. Me, I'm like, I'll do it all by myself. Okay, maybe that was birth from, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> Andreessen's a multi-multi-billionaire. I'm not, mm-hmm. right? And I'm successful. I'm not complaining in the slightest. But the difference was he was willing to learn from, uh, I think his name was Jim Clark. He was willing to learn from Jim Clark's mistakes in business. And I was too stubborn to do that. Yeah. And same thing with uh, Mark Zuckerberg. You know, he, he's 25, whatever. He comes out to Silicon Valley, hooks up with, I think it was Sheryl Sandberg and a bunch of other people who knew what they were doing and took guidance. Yeah. And... When it comes to spiritual or emotional or psychological learning, if you're younger and younger being probably under 30, to be honest, there's all sorts of stuff you don't know. And almost anyone who's in their you know, 60 plus is just so happy to have you not go through all the suffering they went through. And it's just like yeah. they, they know it, they've done, they made the mistakes, they felt the pain, and they will just tell you over lunch everything you need to know if you yeah. can hear it. Yeah. How would you guide someone under 30 Mm-hmm. to be able to take in all the wisdom from someone over 60? I mean, to go back to those traditions of just like really cherishing our elders, you know, these native tribes, I mean, this was a given, right? Like, I mean, I think unfortunately we've created a society that is so informed by their devices and we've lost touch with human communication. And I love picking people's brains and particularly like, I mean, I've got this new neighbor and I think she's 70 something. And, you know, I just wanted to talk about her relationship with her husband. It's her third marriage and the things she's learned, the mistakes she's made. And it was such a beautiful conversation. So I think to answer your question with one word, it's curiosity. And I feel like you as a dad will know it gave me chills. So I know that there's a resonance of truth there. You have probably heard the word, one single word from your children more than any other word. And it's simply why. Mm. Why? Why? And I think what happens is it gets beaten out of kids, not necessarily literally, although sadly, sometimes literally, where our curiosity is frowned upon and we're force fed the answers, whether it be through these school systems that are obviously, you know, the propaganda that is pushed into children and then obviously even through college. Here are the answers. Here are the answers. And um, I feel it sadly dilutes and it sometimes completely diminishes curiosity. So I would say to anybody who's 30 less or anyone of any age, stay curious. I, it's one of my own mantras to myself. I say, stay in the unknown. Yeah, stay in the unknown. And the old Louise Hay things, is it true? Is it real? Those kinds of questions. Yeah. I, and they're, they're more valuable than you might think. Yeah, we're all explorers ultimately. And it's, uh, you know, the... The old story of the the psychologist who was a little bit full of himself and wanted to understand about Zen, and he's like, "All right, well, what's all this nonsense about Zen?" And I'm send me to this monk, and so he goes to see the guy, and he sits down, and the monk invites him for a cup of tea, and he starts pouring the kettle into his cup, and the water's getting close to the top, and the the doctor's looking, he's like, well, "Is the guy going to stop?" And he keeps pouring, keeps pouring, he's like. Why are you pouring? Can't you see the cup is full? He said, like your mind, you already have all the answers to Zen. How am I supposed to teach you? (laughs) So good. Yeah. So I like to, as much as people come to me for so many answers of what I know, my three favorite words, which set me free 20 something years ago is, I don't know, but I'm willing to take a look with you. Yeah. Great answer. I don't know, but I'm willing to take a look with you. Yeah. Uh, one of the things that you've built uh, that I wanted to let our listeners know about is you have a, your online freedom platform yeah. where you're teaching a lot of your work and all that. Can you just take a minute and tell me what that is? Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really excited about that. We just literally started that this year. We wanted to make it more accessible. Some of my courses, because of the depth that I go into, aren't always you know, price point available for people. So this is just a monthly subscription. Um, it has nearly all my workshops that cover anxiety, depression, health, relationships, creating your future consciously. My flagship program called Free Your Mind, which is 30 plus videos. Uh, I do a monthly Ask Me Anything. People can post questions. There's a community component where people can interact. And so that's really going to be my legacy now. I'm calling it my own version of a conscious Netflix where, you know, instead of watching a bunch of violent 
drama and death and God knows what, you get to explore your own potential. And it's the merging of what I call spiritual awakening with human optimization. Mm. Uh, so that's freedom. I I like that. I like the direction towards freedom. It's 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 really Thank important. You. Uh, URL yeah. for it? I didn't put that in my notes. What's that? What's the URL for it? I didn't. Uh, uh, if they just go to petercrone.com forward slash freedom. Okay. It's, it's right there on the website, just at petercrone.com. Okay. Yeah. And there's going to be more and more. I'm actually curating some experts to come in. I don't want it just to solely be me, although there's a ton of content. There's like 60 hours right now of programming that's worth like $7,000 or something. So we're going to bring in other experts that I'm already starting to line up. So yeah, it's really fun. It's uh, it, it's really good. And, and I, I think, what we're going to see moving forward is more long form curated paid content. Yeah. So, so when I, I started out maybe 14 years ago, if I'm doing my math right, yeah, uh, on, on making online content, I was doing 3,000 word articles. You know, a book is 100,000 words. Wow. So that means, you know, every month, if I'm doing an article, you know, once a day, uh, yeah. Every month is is a full book. Yeah, right. And I didn't quite write that often, but I I came close. So now I have three thousand articles on the website, and no one wants to read long articles anymore. Right. So then they want maybe an audio book, but even those they want less of now. So then they want Instagram clips. Yeah. Even this podcast will probably have thirty times more views of our clips on Instagram than we do of the full episode. Even though the full episode is going to reach you know, hundred plus thousand people. I mean, this is a top whatever, yeah. 2% podcast. Yeah. So even with all that, like, how do we get the knowledge out there? And do our listeners want to waste their time or do they want curated, focused, high quality content? Yeah. And you can go to Netflix and it's basically shot by guys with, bouncing the camera around to keep your nervous system's attention with annoying soundtrack, harsh, like yeah. crappy coloring in the blue and orange spectrum because it gets your nervous system's attention yeah. like a poisonous snake. Yeah, uh, and then you sit there and you're like, I kind of have a headache. I got nothing but a series of fight scenes interspersed with sex, but no nudity. Yeah, and I, I kind of am over the Netflix thing. Oh yeah. Uh, so what are we going to spend our time on? And we just well, like, what is curated, valuable content that's gone through? In this case, your filter or my filter, whoever's filter. Yeah, uh, and then. It's a value, and, and that's my goal for the show. And I plan to keep doing these forever because it's fun for me. But yeah, when people listen, they know they're getting it. And when people go into the freedom platform that you've got, you're putting the time in to make the stuff that was worth it. So, are you going to get a better experience from Netflix or from Freedom? Yeah, uh, I think Freedom is going to have a higher ROI for people who listen to it on a per minute basis. Just yeah, my guess. I I really appreciate it, and I knew you'd get it. I didn't know you were familiar with it, but I'm really grateful that you brought it up because it's all new and. You know, you speak the same thing, right? All the work that you do is to make a difference. Ultimately, we want to yeah. better people's lives if we break it down. And, you, know? and you can run a business that improves people's lives. In fact, um, you do. I mean, you're, you're charging for freedom and all. And here's the thing: if you're listening to this, going, you know, how dare you charge for it? I would just invite you to notice the podcast is free. This interview with Peter is free. And if you're still triggered, I would invite you to hire a therapist. And if you're still triggered, you yeah. could just stop listening to the show right? because it's triggering you. And you know you don't have to do anything. There's no one making you do it. Yeah. The reality is, if I'm going to keep doing this for the next 130 plus years, uh, I would like to be able to pay for my production budget. Exactly. And I don't have any issues with that. And anyone who does, I, you know, it's, it's time to think about that. You know, where do you want to put your time and your dollars? There's plenty of free stuff from you, plenty of free stuff from me. And yeah. if we're going to go deep, and hire a film crew and do the good stuff. Yeah. Sometimes it costs money and it's okay to share the cost with everyone. And so I, I just want all listeners, guys, just to understand there are spiritually oriented, mission driven entrepreneurs yeah. who are doing really good work in the world through entrepreneurship. And there are people who copy other people's stuff, they steal it, they cheapen it, they make the plastic version, uh, and then they, they, they stand up there and tell a story that's not even true. And the only way that I know of to tell the difference between those two types is intuition. We talked about it. There's a difference in feeling when you see Peter online versus if you see, you know, someone who copied someone who copied someone who copied someone. Yeah. It, yeah. I don't know what it is, but you can tell. Uh, and then support the people doing the good work, whether it's us or someone else. Yeah. Thank you, my friend. I, I, 
you know, fortunately I get stopped like you, I'm sure around town and people are just so grateful because there's 200, 300 hours just of podcasts that I've done, all of which are free. I don't charge anything, obviously the Instagram posts, none of it's me sitting in front of my salad or a car. It's always a clip that hopefully makes a difference or a quote that contributes to somebody's day. And I think as humans, when we realize the generosity of somebody's spirit to want to make a difference, then the reciprocation factor is automatic. You know, like people are like, well, I'd love to support your cause because, you know, you make a difference. And, and I also do so many scholarships. I mean, we've put one of my free or future workshops. Uh, now I think we have 4,000 prisoners who've gotten that for free, you know. So we do the work in the background too to support those who can't do it. Good, good for you and, and thank you. Yeah. Well, Peter, it, this, is, this is a beautiful introduction to your work. And guys, come to the biohacking conference. It's May 30th, 31st, beginning of June, three days in Dallas. And this is our 10th annual with the best speaker lineup we've ever had. It's bigger. The number of vendors is more expansive. You get to play with the toys. And you'll see Peter walking around looking at all this stuff and you get interactions with speakers. Almost all of the speakers come and hang out for the whole time. Yeah. Uh, Dr. McColl says it's his favorite conference ever. Yeah. Uh, and he'll be there uh, again. Um, he's almost always at the conference unless there's a scheduling conflict because he loves it. And you know, you'll see Dr. Dispenza and so many other people, Daniel Amen. It's, it's going to be the most powerful conference that I've ever put on. And so I would invite you, biohackingconference.com. Tickets are still discounted because we have time. And as we get closer into the event, they get more expensive as fewer of them are there. We will almost certainly sell out this year because it's looking to be so powerful. And you'll learn directly from Peter Krohn, which is one of the reasons we're on the show now. Peter, yeah. thanks again for your work in the world. Like It's awesome. Thank you, dude. You, your community you've created, it really speaks volumes about who you are as a human. I just want to acknowledge you because I personally can attest to it's one of my favorite conferences to go to. I'm flattered that I'm there as a speaker for you. I've made so many great friends. I've certainly bought plenty of toys and gadgets to help my own life. And I'm excited to see you there and to speak to everyone who shows up who wants to come and say hi. See you guys on the next episode, if not at the Biohacking Conference. You're listening to The Human Upgrade with Dave Asprey.